Well, guys, I just uh, had some random thoughts and Ben and I were recording our podcast. And we're doing some research and we found some stuff that we thought was really beneficial, but not necessarily relevant to the creed. So we wanted to kind of figure out some ways to share some like background stuff uh, that can help enhance maybe some of the conversations and what we're talking about, but may not fit tightly into what we're actually discussing. So think of it this way. It's like uh, the Silmarillion or like the lore for Lord of the Rings, right? <laughs> like you don't need it, but it could be beneficial and you may enjoy it. Who knows? So that's kind of where we're at. So we were doing, I was doing some studying this week and uh, I'm going to share with you two books that I think that if you want to read, they're really great. Um, I'll do it in order of which I would read them, which one I think is more important and significant. The first one is this book by Alison McGrath called Heresy. And the second one is a book, uh, this one's a little more difficult and rigorous. So if you're new to theology, maybe wait a little bit and read some other ones first. Uh, but this one's really great. It's called Christ and Culture by H. Richard Niebuhr. And it's a really great book. Uh, definitely worth a read. Um, both of them are worth reads. And they're both really good at like clarifying Christian beliefs. This one's a little bit more critical and requires a little bit more like in-depth thought, but this one's a great place to start, especially if you're trying to really figure out where you stand in the faith. Uh, either way though, I really wanted to talk about uh, some of our background work. So I, I, I've been researching Gnosticism, right? Because that is one of the big reasons that the creed was formalized and created. They, they gave language and breathed life into the, uh, this creed with the express purpose of trying to clarify what it wasn't. And one of the things they were trying to clarify against was this Gnostic movement. Now, as I was studying, I found a common theme that I think is really relevant and applicable to our lives today about Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a Hellenistic belief, which means it was really, really Greek, and the Romans loved the Greeks, which means they were all about integrating like the Greek ideas into their society, right? It's a big deal. They, they really want, what's the word I'm looking for? They really, really want to like kind of relive that history and kind of like a weird nostalgia love and they wanted to be kind of pluralistic in their own sophisticated way and so a lot of what they did in this Hellenistic culture was do a lot of blending right and so we talk a little about pluralism so right now i think especially at this time in the united states or really in the 21st the 21st century in general we're really kind of experiencing a return to that kind of thought process and again this isn't a knock on like that the intention behind it the intention is different one was a fascist system in order to kind of like recreate an empire Ours now is a little different, but it's going to have very similar themes in it, right? Ours is now to include everybody to, in order to protect and help them. So a better intention, uh, but maybe some same catastrophic results. So that's when we're going to get into it. So what Gnosticism did is it would take ideas from Christianity, right? And it would, it would discuss Jesus and the faith and his life and his death and his resurrection in the terms of Plato's Greek philosophy. More to the point, it would embrace some other ideas here. And so what, what fundamentally starts happening here is not just like an intellectual discussion, but it's the first time that the church has really started having its own ideas be influenced by the culture. What that means is this, and this is a really big, big idea point. This is the first time Christians are really dealing with, or at least actively addressing the fact that culture is changing how they believe and what they say, Right. So a lot of times in churches, and I, I tend to be resistant against it because I think it can go a bad way, but it is a relevant and interesting point. We talk about like, let's not conform to the culture. You know, Paul said, don't conform to the patterns of the world, right? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, it's a similar idea. What is happening right now is they're, they're willing to compromise their belief to address and engage. And as I was reading this, I, I found out that like, it's kind of the same stuff that goes on nowadays, you know, and, and I don't want to, I, I guess I am getting on a soapbox. That's what this is, right? We, we kind of allow sometimes culture to dictate what we say and how we say. Mm -hmm. And we let the ideas come from external sources and we use other people's language. But the real truth of the Christian gospel is not how we engage in a world politically. It's not how we engage with technical theological terms. Uh, that is a flaw, and that's fundamentally Western. The fundamental truth of Christianity is that it speaks for itself, and that the hope and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the community that it builds in the church, right, that you actively participate in, you as a Christian are part of a body, right? You're part of the church. You're in something that is actively moving and breathing and impacting the world. It It's different because in some ways it refuses to be systematized which is really hard for people like me that are type A that like to like organize things in the boxes mm -hmm. and say it specifically. I, I probably am very particular about my language. In fact, you've probably heard it already. 
but it's bigger than that and it's powerful and it's breathing and active and it's as much when we talk about trying to put the church in this way it's as much trying to put the church in a box as it is like putting ourselves in a box and the greatest irony of all this is that we really refuse to do that now think about all the ways in which we refuse to limit our liberties if we want to give some political examples again me not speculating on what side of the fence you're on just me giving some relevant examples you know people not wanting to wear masks right now i totally get it it's hot and stuffy but at the same time, it's social service, but yeah, you feel like your liberty are being trampled on. I get it. Totally get it. Or the people on the other side of the aisle, right, that tend to not conform to gender, right? That they don't think they think gender is a social construct, right? They don't want to be put into a box on how they view themselves as a being. The fundamental idea is here that we can't always put live and active things in boxes and that the Christian faith is active and moving. And we can't let our culture and what we should and shouldn't say there dictate the way we express the love of God. Here's the here's what we know, that he's going to come back and he's ultimately going to win the battle, and that he's already defeated and conquered death. So language games is something that he can easily overcome, and he's always going to win. So I guess this is a, a soapbox for a couple different things. One to say <laughs> that culture is a really important thing. Be active in it. Go engage in it. Do that stuff. That's wonderful. But at the same time, don't let it own you. There's a really really difficult thin thin fine line to walk. I mean, embracing the culture and what it tells you to say and being afraid to engage in it. And you got to balance that tight wire act with a lot of strength. And you probably won't be able to do it alone. So here, here comes the pastoral part of this. I'm not a pastor, <laughs> but here comes the pastoral part. Uh, you're going to have to get some guidance, probably from the Holy Spirit, because I don't have a good theological prescriptive answer for it. But maybe that's the whole point here is that maybe there is a good theological prescriptive answer for it. Maybe this is the spirit of God moving. This is the faith aspect of what we do right? This is where God breaks in. So I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts and think about that, that as we're talking about the creeds, they came about as a reaction to this. But the big idea about Gnosticism is a blending of culture into the church and into Christian belief systems. So maybe this week, as you're kind of thinking about our podcast, or maybe as you're listening and adjusting our materials in different way, ways, ask yourself, have I let cultural language or the culture influence me in a way that I've fundamentally watered down the gospel and I've hmm. put into a nice box? You know, I told Ben earlier that it can go one of two ways. Either we can try to bend Christianity like the Gnostics did, right? Where we bend it to fit into the philosophical belief system of Platonism of the day, right? Where we twist it and we have to reinterpret things. This is a true story and they go about it in here. So this is a really funny read. There's gonna be some parts you're gonna laugh at. There was a group of heretics that were so against Jesus being a human being that he faked eating and didn't poop or pee, which is insane. It's an absolutely insane thing to think. Or to, or to say out loud, right? Like think of how absurd this is you're listening to it now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like like they were so against it that they couldn't even acknowledge that reality, right? Um, they bent who Jesus was as a human being to fit their philosophical belief system because God can't be flesh. We've I've mm -hmm. talked about that ad nauseum on the podcast. You know, on the flip side, right? Um, what we can do sometimes is we can do something a bit more subtle. We can kind of, whittle down Jesus in different ways. And we can fit him perfectly culturally and smooth the edges. And instead of twisting who he is, we just describe him in the way that's most advantageous in the moment, right? To fit him in there. So Marcion, one of the other Gnostics in this book that we're gonna talk about, that guy really, really had a problem with like Jewish people. Uh, to be honest with you, it's, it, the more I read about him, the more I'm like, this guy's kind of like anti-Semitic. Um, uh, not in like the modern way, but like an ancient way. Like he wasn't out murdering people, but just like kind of racist. Um, just yeah. be really blunt. Uh, but he, he didn't really like Old Testament. So what he would do is he would just de-emphasize and eventually ultimately redact and remove parts of scripture to make his point in Christianity more palatable to the Greeks yeah. and to people. And, and so my, my sermon at today, my soapbox today is not coming from a passage. If there's any passage, it's that passage I quoted of Paul uh, in Romans, I believe. Uh, but it's ultimately this, that we have to balance out culture and its impact on us. And it's so hard to do. And I have yet, I have yet, and I probably won't ever really truly master it, but it's something to think about as you're going about it, as you're even reading these theological books, right. Or even reading the Bible, but it's just food for thought.